There we go. There we go. Hey, folks, we are honored here tonight uh, to have Dwight Hughes with us uh, to speak on his book, uh, Unlike Anything That Ever Floated. Uh, it's about the Battle of Hampton Roads, March 8th, 9th, 1862. And Dwight is a Navy veteran, a uh, Vietnam veteran of that. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Hughes graduated from the Naval Academy in 1967, served 20 years aboard warships, Navy staffs, and with river forces in Vietnam. Holds a master's uh, degree in, uh, in political science and an MS in information systems management. He authored one book in 2015 on the cruise of the CSS Shenandoah. He's a contributed author to the Emerging Civil War series. I know he's working on another book right now for ECW. And so without further ado, folks, it is my honor and privilege to introduce to you Dwight Hughes. Sir, unmute yourself and it's all yours. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can all hear me all right. Uh, um, Forgive me if, uh, if we have to, have, to, have to pause to clear my throat a little bit. I've been a little bit under the weather, but um, let's get started here. Shall I share? I'm going to share my uh, share my slides here. Let's see if we can get this. Okay. Now, can everybody see the slides? Okay. We doing all right? All right, good. Well, thank you very much. We're going to talk about the USS Monitor and the Battle of Hampton Roads. Saturday, March 8th, 1862, the USS Monitor steams into Chesapeake Bay after rushing down from New York through gale force winds, almost sinking in the process. Monitor's mission was to defeat the Confederate ironclad ram, the CSS Virginia, before she destroyed the wooden warships of the Union fleet in Hampton Roads. Monitor was a steam propelled iron plated raft with a cylindrical iron turret and two 11 inch guns. The flat and expansive deck was barely a foot and a half above the surface. 14 officers and 57 crewmen were encased in the hull below the waterline. The captain ordered an exhausted and dispirited crew to strip the vessel of her sea rig and make all preparations for battle. To mid 19th century mariners, this enclosed cramped artificial space, which resembled future submarines, was a radical departure from sailing and fighting on the open decks and in the high rigging of a traditional man of war, and not a little intimidating. Monitor redefined the relationship between men and machines in war, challenging ancient concepts of honor and valor. These developments paralleled the transformative combat experience of soldiers who began the conflict standing up in open fields manfully confronting the enemy face to face, but ended up burrowing into trenches and crouching behind elaborate fortifications. Technology had advanced the defense over the offense. Paymaster William Teeler wrote to his wife, you may rest assured that your better half will be in no more danger from rebel compliments than if he was seated with you at home. There isn't danger enough to give us any glory. Not a man is exposed in action. Our boilers and our entire machinery are completely and effectually pr are protected. Monitor would become a cultural icon of American industrial strength and ingenuity in advertisements for everything from whiskey to refrigerators. She embodied social and institutional as well as industrial revolutions. But this would be a symbolic role which would outshine her accomplishments beyond a single engagement in a specific set of circumstances. After the battle with the, with the Virginia, the Union caught monitor fever. 50 monitors would be built in a bewildering range of one, two, and three turret classes. But as a warship type, they were of limited utility. 
with a low profile, monitors were not seagoing vessels and were not effective against shore fortifications, although they did neutralize several Confederate ironclads. The most important technical innovation was the rotating armored turret, which would evolve into 20th century battleships. But during Monitor's construction, public opinion had been decidedly ambivalent concerning this strange watercraft. The technological transition in one generation from timeless horse-drawn transportation to huge puffing locomotives had been breathtaking for the people. On the water, tall warships always inspired awe, but so far they look much the same, even when driven by steam as well as sail. It was not clear where little monitor fit in this revolution. Was she even a ship or just a small ironclad two-gun battery? Many could not conceive that a slab of iron would even float. One Vermont reporter could hardly find words to describe the thing. She is in fact, unlike anything that ever floated on Neptune's bosom. Viewed from a distance, Monitor looked insignificant and harmless. But standing upon its deck, he wrote, she appeared powerful and invulnerable. This sea monster resembled the Leviathan of the scriptures. The vessel had a most singular appearance, wrote one officer. From a half mile distance, she appeared to be sinking. The hull was not even visible while the turret sat upon the water by itself. People said she looked like a wash tub on a raft, a cheese box on a plank, a hat on a shingle, etc., etc. Nathaniel Hawthorne would write it looked like a gigantic rat trap. It was ugly, questionable, suspicious, evidently mischievous. Nay, I will allow myself to call it devilish. Monitor's captain, John L. Warden, recalled, here was an unknown, untried vessel with all but a small portion below the waterline, her crew to live with the ocean beating over their heads. An iron coffin-like ship, of which the gloomiest predictions were made, with her crew shut out from sunlight and the air above the sea, depending entirely on artificial means to supply the air they breathe. A failure of the machinery would be almost certain death to her men. Monitor proceeded across Chesapeake Bay as evening descended. They heard heavy guns in the distance. Plumes of smoke hung over the land. Little black spots sprang into the air, paused for a moment, and expanded into large white clouds. Gun flashes lit the darkening horizon. Bursting shells flashed in the air. The pilot boarded and informed them that the dreaded Virginia was raking havoc at Hampton Roads. The USS Cumberland was sunk. The USS Congress was ablaze. Vessels were fleeing like a covey of frightened quails. Their lights danced over the water in all directions. The steam frigate USS Minnesota, the most powerful ship the Navy could deploy that day, had run hard aground off Newport News earlier in the day while pursuing the marauding Virginia. The rebel monster surely would return in the morning to destroy Minnesota. Warden was ordered to take Monitor to defend her. An atmosphere of gloom pervaded the fleet, recalled Lieutenant Green. The pygmy aspect of the newcomer did not inspire confidence among those who had witnessed the destruction of the day before. Congress blazed like a gigantic torch stuck in the mud where she had been pulverized by Virginia. Around 2 a.m. she blew up. Certainly a grander sight was never seen, wrote Lieutenant Green, but it went straight to the marrow of our bones. Nearest to, at the bottom of the river, lay the Cumberland with her silent crew of brave men 
who died while fighting their guns to the water's edge. The USS Monitor entered Hampton Roads, cleared for actions, and anchored near Minnesota. Her journey to this point has been had been as unprecedented as the impending battle. Let us step back a bit and look at her origins. A furious ironclad arms race was on in Europe. New developments in naval armaments, larger guns, explosive shells, rifled bores, had rendered wooden warships increasingly vulnerable. Significant improvements had been made in iron armor as demonstrated in the recent Crimean War. The French launched the first ironclad battleship, the Gloire, in November 1859. <clears throat> in 1860, the British produced the magnificent HMS Warrior, the first warship with a wholly iron hull and the most advanced, most powerful in the world. The U.S. Navy had been in the forefront of developments in steam propulsion and naval armaments. In the 1840s and 50s, the Navy ceased building sail-only warships while developing advanced wooden steam cruisers, culminating in the Merrimack Frigate class. These powerful warships were equal to or superior to conventional European frigates. But Americans had no far-flung empire to defend and no neighboring threats. Naval strategy focused on harbor and coastal defense with swift cruisers like Merrimack to protect commerce in distant waters. They let the Europeans pursue costly experiments in the unproven technology of iron armor. Then secession altered the strategic picture dramatically. In Europe, the war disrupted industry, trade, and finance, causing high unemployment and social and political unrest. Great Britain seriously considered intervening on behalf of the Confederacy, perhaps forcefully. British support for rebel commerce raiders and blockade running enraged the United States. Arguments over the responsibilities of neutral countries in wartime harken back to 1812 and the revolution. The specter of a third war with Great Britain, the world's most powerful nation, now armed with seagoing ironclads became real and immediate. In the summer of 1861, Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells struggled with the notion of ironclad vessels. It was a subject full of difficulty and doubt, he told Congress. England and France had built large, powerful seagoing ironclads. The United States had none. It was evident that a new and material element in maritime warfare was developing itself and demanded immediate attention. Iowa Senator James Grimes supported the development of ironclads. We need a more effective blockade, he wrote. Scoundrels north as well as scoundrels south are carrying on an unlawful trade in fraud of our revenue. Pirates and sea rovers must be captured. Southern harbors and forts must be retaken. Commerce must be protected and northern harbors defended. Suppose England, in her love for cotton, should attempt to break our blockade, and we should get into trouble with her. What is to become of our northern cities and our cities upon the coast? Secretary Wells was overseeing an immense, unprecedented warship procurement and building program while instigating a nearly impossible continent-wide blockade. Without further study, he concluded, it would not be advisable to commit heavy expenditures by way of experiment on the unproving technology of iron armor. But the most immediate threats were Confederate ironclads under construction in Norfolk, Mobile, and New Orleans, particularly the former USS Merrimack to become the CSS Virginia. 
the Mobile Register boasted that this new weapon would be a floating fortress that will be able to defeat the whole Navy of the United States and bombard its cities. With their great size, strength, powerful engines, and invulnerable iron casing, she would easily destroy or disperse the blockading fleet. She could throw bombs into Fort Monroe. We hope to hear that she is ready to commence her avenging career on the seas. Northern public opinion was aroused also. The Philadelphia Examiner thought it curious that the United States should be so behind the age. If we intend to have a national naval force worthy of our power and pretensions, we shall have to build iron case vessels as France and England have done and are doing. Congress directed Secretary Wells to appoint an ironclad board to investigate plans and specifications for constructing iron or steel clad steamships or steam batteries, appropriating for the purpose one and a half million dollars. Wells selected three senior line officers, two commodores, crusty old salts of the wooden canvas Navy, veterans of the War of 1812, and one commander. The board advertised for proposals and from them recommended three designs. To confront the potential European threat, the first two designs were conventional wooden hulls with iron cladding, broadside battery, auxiliary steam engines, and sailing rig. They would become the USS New Ironsides and the USS Galena. The final board selection was proposed by Swedish engineer John Erickson. The intense stocky Erickson, born in 1803, had a long career in Sweden, England, and America, designing, building, and improving steam engines. He produced a host of inventions, including the shipboard steam condenser, and collected numerous patents. Erickson's proposal possessed, recalled Secretary Wells, extraordinary and valuable features for coast and river blockade. It involved a revolution in naval warfare. President Lincoln remarked, all I have to say is what the girl said when she put her foot into the stocking. It strikes me there's something in it. Erickson's low profile concept was inspired by Swedish lumber rafts. He never claimed to have invented the revolving armored turret. The idea had been circulating among engineers for decades, but he was the first to successfully deploy it. The ironclad board had serious reservations, but reluctantly agreed to proceed. The plan addressed the critical requirements, a combat ready craft suitable for restricted waters, to be rapidly constructed and deployed. In its favor were presumed invulnerability, small size, shallow draft, and limited exposed target area. Worrisome unknowns included over-reliance on steam power, semi-submerged hull, questionable stability, and untried turret-mounted armament. Monitor also was unseaworthy and an uncomfortable and cramped environment to operate guns and steam machinery. The contract was signed on October 4th, 1861 for an ironclad shot proof steam battery. John Erickson and his backers were to deliver the vessel complete and ready for service within the unprecedented span of 100 days for a price of $275,000. Erickson began a frenetic and incredibly complex manufacturing process using civilian facilities because Navy shipyards had no capabilities to produce ironclads. He orchestrated a unique conglomerate of nine contractors and multiple subcontractors working simultaneously in at least seven Northeast cities to produce raw materials angle iron, bar iron, plate iron, and rivets, and finished components for assembly at Continental Iron Works in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. 
Most of the firms clustered around New York City and Albany, centers of steam engine and iron manufacturing. They applied methods and materials in common use for locomotives and other land products. Only Yankees could produce an experimental ironclad vessel from scratch in 100 days. Despite the rush, Erickson did not scrimp on furnishings and gadgets. The officers' closet-sized staterooms were appointed, were appointed in Victorian opulence out of Erickson's own purse, while the crewmen slept in hammocks on the more utilitarian berth deck. Six-inch round glass windows or deck lights set in the deck overhead, supplemented by oil lamps, provided meager illumination. Erickson crafted a compact 400 horsepower steam engine with a single cylinder 40 inches in diameter, driving two horizontal pistons. Auxiliary steam engines, an uncommon feature at the time, drove the turret and the ventilation blowers. A steam condenser provided fresh water. The guns were mounted in customized low profile friction carriages to dampen recoil in the confined turret. Erickson installed the first custom design pressure flushing below the waterline water closets or heads. Surgeon Daniel Logue operated the flushing valves in the wrong order and suffered the indignity of being blown off the seat by a jet of water. Gideon Wells selected 27 year veteran Lieutenant John L. Warden to command monitor. Warden had been captured by Confederates the previous year while running secret dispatches to Fort Pickens in Florida becoming the conflict's first prisoner of war. Confined in Alabama for eight months before being exchanged, Warden was still ill and weak when he assumed command. Lieutenant Samuel, sorry, what's going on? There we go. Lieutenant Samuel Damio, Dana Green was named executive officer, second in command. The 22-year-old Marylander graduated from the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis in June 1859. Green represented the Young Professional Officer Corps, educated at the new school, steeped in new technologies, and fired in the crucible of war to lead the Navy into the 20th century. On the drizzly morning of January 30th, 1862, monitors slid down the ways into the East River before a large spontaneous crowd. The New York Tribune wrote, the assemblies cheered rapturously as the strange looking craft glided swiftly and gracefully into its new element. Nearby vessels fired salutes. Predictions that she would break her back or swamp upon launching were disproven. But the CSS Virginia was expected to appear in Hampton Roads any day. So work continued around the clock to complete fitting out. Despite futile attempts at secrecy, journalists swarmed the ship, leaving in their reporting little to the imagination. Captain Warden sought volunteers from warships in New York Harbor. He described to them the probable perils of passage and the certainty of combat. Many more enthusiastically responded than were required. A better crew no naval commander ever had the honor to command, Warden would write. Few of them had pre-war sea service. Most were recent recruits with little or no maritime experience. Some were European immigrants and at least two were African-American. These volunteers endured ribbing from their fellow seamen. In a solemn and prophetic tone, one old salt proclaimed, you fellows certainly got a lot of nerve or want to commit suicide, one or the other. Several volunteers took one look at Monitor and promptly deserted. 
After hurried and superficial testing, Monitor got underway for Hampton Roads on March 6, 1862. On the morning of Saturday, March 8th, as Monitor approached the entrance to the Chesapeake Bay, a frustrated commander in chief convened a council of war to prod Major General George B. McClellan into action on his proposed campaign to capture Richmond. He planned to land at Urbana on the Rappahannock, but as General Joe Johnston fell back from Manassas, McClellan decided instead to invade the peninsula at Fort Monroe. Throughout that afternoon, as the conference continued, telegrams filtered in as the former USS Merrimack, now CSS Virginia, sallied forth into Hampton Roads. The Merrimack is close at hand. The Merrimack is engaging the Cumberland at close quarters. The Congress is now burning. For a while, the news looked very badly, recalled Presidential Secretary John Hay. Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton ordered the news be made public at once to alert northern ports that they were in great danger. The next morning, Sunday, March 9th, wrote a senior treasury official, was as gloomy as any that Washington had experienced since the beginning of the war. The president called an emergency session at the White House for a much alarmed cabinet. John Hay reported that panic was intense at Willard's Hotel. Nothing was too wild to be believed. Presidential secretaries John Hay and John Nicolay characterized this cabinet meeting as perhaps the most excited and impressive of the whole war. Gideon Wells was asked what could be done to counter this formidable monster. The Navy secretary had no answers beyond faith in the untried monitor. She should have arrived in Hampton Roads the day before, but due to a break in the telegraph cable, they had no news of her. Wells recorded in his diary that, quote, the most frightened man was the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. He was at times almost frantic. Stanton's words were broken and denunciatory. The panic under which he labored added to, added to the apprehension of others. According to Wells, Stanton insisted that the rebel ironclad would change the whole character of the war. She would destroy every naval vessel and take Fort Monroe. McClellan's campaign against Richmond must be abandoned. General Burnside's forces must be recalled from the North Carolina Sounds. The vital blockading port of Port Royal Sound must be given up. Virginia would come up the Potomac, disperse Congress, destroy the capital. She might go to New York and Boston and destroy those cities or hold them for ransom. The Army Secretary was contemptuous of the notion that a two-gun iron raft could stop her. Secretaries Nicolay and Hay wrote that Stanton walked up and down the room like a caged lion. Chase was impatient. Wells and Seward were hopeful. McClellan was dumbfounded and silent. The president was, as usual in trying moments, composed but eagerly inquisitive, critically scanning the dispatches, interrogating the officers, joining scrap to scrap of information, applying his searching analysis and clear logic to read the danger and find the remedy. Wells caustically described Stanton peering out the window with an expansive view down the Potomac, expecting a rebel shell to land in the White House before they left the room. The possibilities of the hour were indeed sufficiently portentous to create consternation. But Wells assured them that Virginia was so loaded down with armor, she could not venture outside Hampton Roads. She could not, quote, ascend the river in surprises with a cannonball. Certainly she could not attack simultaneously every city and harbor on the coast. 
it would better become us Wells advised to calmly consider the situation and inspire confidence by acting so far as we could with discretion and judgment. Stanton telegraphed governors and major cities in the North, telling them to man their forts and place timber rafts and other obstructions at the mouths of harbors. Preparations were made to block the Potomac. Finally, that Sunday afternoon, the chattering telegraph produced the lost message of the night before. Monitor had arrived and will take care of the Virginia. The president and his cabinet awaited the outcome. In Hampton Roads that morning, the USS Minnesota was still hard aground. The crew making hasty preparations to abandon ship with monitor anchored nearby. Fog lifting from the water about 8 a.m. revealed the CSS Virginia approaching. Minnesota's captain declared to monitors Captain Warden, if I could not lighten my ship off the shoal, I shall destroy her. Warden assured him, I will stand by you to the last if I can help you. No, sir, you cannot help me, was the reply. Within the dim claustrophobic metal drum of Monitor's turret, 20 feet in diameter, behind eight inches of iron, squatted the two immense 11 inch Dahlgren smoothbores. Lieutenant Green supervised 16 brawny sailors packed in eight to a gun. None of them had been drilled on, this, on these guns in this turret. Captain Warden took station in the pilot house platform near the bow, his head and shoulders in the box, peering through a half inch viewing slip. Jammed at his elbow was the pilot and the helmsman. The only communication between the pilot house and the turret was via runners between the two stations. Below the turret, recalled Paymaster Keeler, everyone was at his post fixed like a statue. The most profound silence reigned. If there had been a coward heart there, its throb would have been audible, so intense was the stillness. I experienced a peculiar sensation. I do not think it was fear, but it was different from anything I ever knew before. <clears throat> we were enclosed in what we supposed to be an, an impenetrable armor. We knew that a powerful foe was about to meet us. Ours was an untried experiment and our enemy's first fire might make it a coffin for us all. The suspense was awful as we waited in the dim light expecting every moment to hear the crash of our enemy's shot. Warden charged directly for Virginia, placing a little monitor between Minnesota and the foe. In the gloom below the turret, Keeler heard the muffled whomp of a gun, then another and another. Virginia and Minnesota blasted away at each other at long range, skipping shelves across the water's surface. Rounds could take 20 to 40 skips. Several friendly shots bounced off monitor. Wrote Keeler, the infernal howl of the shells as they flew over our vessel was all that broke the silence and made it seem still more terrible. Captain Warden closed to about a third of a mile, altered course and ordered commence firing. The mammoth gun port cover rumbled open. The big black muzzle protruded. Lieutenant Green yanked the fire lock at 8.45 a.m. The entire structure throbbed and trembled with a deafening concussion as the eight-ton behemoth leapt inward. The rebel ironclad turned her head upstream and replied with a broadside, followed by a volume of musketry, which rattled on our iron decks like hailstones, but caused no damage. These first shots made quite a sensation on worried gunners inside the turret. Warden expected that most rebel shots against the curved exterior would glance off without damage. 
but he worried that a shot fired directly in line with the vertical axis of the turret could deform the structure and jam the revolving mechanisms. The captain also worried that hundreds of bolt and rivet heads holding together eight layers of one inch iron plates would blast off inside creating lethal projectiles in the turret when hit outside. In either case, monitor would be helpless. But he reported, a 150 pound projectile hitting straight on from 30 yards just created a smooth dent, a perfect mold of the shell two and a half inches deep. The indentation carried right through eight inches of plate without cracking or splitting the iron. To everyone's relief, enemy fire did not dislodge a single rivet head and the turret continued to revolve. One rebel shot struck the vulnerable deck edge and tore up one of the plates. Worried that the blow might open a seam below the waterline, Warden crawled out of the gun port, walked to the side, lay down upon his chest to examine the damage with bullets zinging off the iron deck as thick as hailstones in a storm. The hull was uninjured except for a few splinters of wood. So he crawled back into the turret. Warden then announced to the crew that Virginia could not sink them if we let us pound us for a month. The men cheered. Guns bellowed through choking white smoke shot with flame. The round scream clang boomed and splashed all around. Engines thumped and clanked, blowers roared. The black clouds billowed from the stacks as the big propellers thrashed the water. Men tramped inside, many stripped to the waist with scraps of, scraps of cloth around their ears, shouted, sweated, and struggled to manage their metal monsters. Virginia's Lieutenant Catesby Jones reported, we were, we were often within a ship's length of monitor. Once while passing, we fired a broadside at her at only a few yards distance. She and her turret appeared to be under perfect control. Her light draft enabled her to move about us at pleasure. Ironclad against ironclad, recalled Monitor's chief engineer Stimmers. We maneuvered about the bay here and went at each other with mutual fierceness. They circled awkwardly in what would appear to a modern observer as slow motion. Five times during the engagement, we touched each other, wrote Lieutenant Green. And each time I fired a gun at Virginia, I will vouch the 168 pounds penetrated her sides. The shot, shell, grape, canister, musker, and rifle, and rifle balls flew about us in every direction, but did us no damage. Our turret was struck several times, and though the noise was pretty loud, it did not affect us any. Inside the turret, two men leaned against the bulkhead, just as a rebel shot whanged against the outside, knocking them senseless. One of them was knocked clear over the gun and his knee injured, but both recovered by the following morning, the only injuries among the crew. The effect upon one shut up in a revolving drum is perplexing, wrote Lieutenant Green. Both vessels were continuously turning, backing, and forwarding, while the turret spun independently. This was not your traditional man of war broadside gun deck. Green could see out only through the few inch gap between the gun muzzle and the top of the gun port a favorite target for eager muskets on Virginia. Through smoke, noise, concussion, and the whirling of the turret, the lieutenant was disoriented and frequently blind. He could not see the enemy. A rebel projectile entering an open gun port would put them out of action. He could not see how his own guns were pointed relative to his own vessel. A careless round striking the pilot house directly in front of the turret would end the fight. 
To make matters worse, the steam-driven turret was very slow to start revolving, and once moving, very slow to stop, even slower to reverse. Like all monitors machinery, these mechanisms were undergoing their first combat trial. Green found it nearly impossible to stop rotation in line of fire, open the gun port, sight and shoot at a target that was itself moving. So he settled on a pattern, rotate the turret away from Virginia and stop to load, leaving gun ports open to save time and effort. Then when ready, start revolving again and fire both guns on the fly as the target swept past the muzzles. Green personally aimed and fired every round. To Virginia's John Taylor Wood, Monitor appeared but a pygmy. But in her size was one great element of her success. The Monitor was firing every seven or eight minutes and nearly every shot struck. A Confederate Marine recalled, when Monitor's turret revolved, we could see nothing but two immense guns. Those guns bellowed and promptly disappeared while his gun crew struggled to respond. Lieutenant Jones wondered how the Yankees could take aim so quickly. The Virginia, however, was a large target, he wrote, and generally so near that the monitor's shot did not often miss. It, it, didn't, it, didn't, it did not appear to us that our shell had any effect on the monitor. Jones maneuvered his lumbering vessel for nearly an hour trying to ram and board monitor. The warden turned away and suffered only a glancing blow. In the process, mon monitor just missed Virginia's submerged stern, almost snapping off her rudder and propeller. As monitor slid by, Virginia delivered a 68 pound rifle shell directly against the pilot house from about 20 yards. Captain Warden's eyes were close behind the viewing slit. The explosion cracked and broke the iron box, flooding it with light. Paymaster Keeler was standing below the platform awaiting orders. A flash of light and a cloud of smoke filled the house. I noticed the captain stagger and put his hands to his eyes. The blood was running from his face, which was blackened with the powder smoke. The pilot and helmsman were shaken but not injured, while a stunned and partially blinded warden ordered the helm to starboard, turning monitor away from the action into shallow water where Virginia could not follow and her guns could not reach. My eyes, Warden said, I am blind, but do not mind me. Save the Minnesota if you can. Lieutenant Green came forward from the turret to assume command. Seeing Monitor withdraw, Minnesota's captain ordered every preparation to destroy his ship. But the rebel ironclad did not approach. Evening was descending, the tide was ebbing, Virginia was damaged and low on ammunition. Lieutenant Jones decided to retire, assuming that he could resume the contest the next day. Confederates would excoriate Jones for leaving Minnesota in enemy hands. Now in command of monitor, Lieutenant Green longed to re-engage, but Virginia was retreating. He had to cover Minnesota. Another hit on his pilot house could be disabling and their wounded captain needed attention. So at about 12.15, Monitor let go a few last shots and turned away. Green also would be criticized for, the dis for this decision by armchair admirals. 
Paymaster Keeler climbed through the iron hatch to a deck strewn with shell fragments. Virginia's parting shot shrieked over their heads and exploded about 100 feet away. Small steamers and boats from Newport News, Fort Monroe, and the various men of war surrounded them, all eager to learn the extent of our injuries and congratulate us on our victory. Thousands of spectators were astonished to learn the monitor was essentially uninjured and ready to resume the fight. Aboard the Minnesota, Assistant Secretary of the Navy Gustavus Fox had seen the whole fight. He hailed down to monitor that they had fought the greatest naval battle on record and behaved as gallantly as men could. Wrote Lieutenant Green to his parents, I felt proud and happy then, Mother, and I felt fully repaid for all that I had suffered. When told that Minnesota was saved, Warden said, then I can die happy. Future Admiral John Warden would recover most of the sight in his right eye, but his face was permanently blackened and his left eye destroyed. Monitor was struck 22 times, twice on the pilot house, nine on the turret, eight in the side armor, and three on deck. Lieutenant Green was black with smoke and powder down to his underclothes. His nervous system was shot. Every bone ached, he could hardly stand. My nerves twitched and muscles twitched as though electric shocks were continually passing through them and my head ached as if it would burst. Sometimes I thought my brain would come out right over my eyebrows. I lay down and tried to sleep. I might as well have tried to fly. Thank you. I'm uh, ready to answer any questions you might have. Hey, Dwight, great presentation. Very much enjoyed that, sir. Thank you. Uh, you know, one of the things I got from your book, um, and maybe you can expand upon it a little bit, was that the monitor actually left New York with only 15-pound half charges. And I think you kind of get into the what if they had been uh, fully charged when they took on the Virginia. Yeah, that's, that's one of the fascinating, one of several fascinating what ifs. Um, <clears throat> The Navy Department was so worried about those guns inside that confined turret uh, that they uh, ordered Warden to only use half charges, 15 pounds of powder in, in the 11-inch uh, in Dahlgrens. And so that's what he did. <clears throat> now, they later claimed that had they used full, full, full charges, they might have been able to penetrate Virginia's armor. And they actually tested the guns with full charges afterwards, and they worked fine. So that was one of the uh, one of the Union what ifs. Um, on the Confederate side, they had loaded their uh, their magazine mostly with uh, explosive shell, assuming that they would be fighting primarily wooden warships. And they later claimed that if they had had more solid round shot, they might have been able to penetrate monitor's armor because the solid shot had more smashing power against the against the iron than the uh, than the uh, explosive shell did. Yep. So there there are a number of uh, what ifs in both in both directions. Hey, do I can you uh, a question I have here is uh, what happened to the uh, monitor and and the Virginia after the battle? Okay, well, the monitor hung around Hampton Roads for the rest of the summer with a brief uh, stop at the Washington Navy Yard. And um, she was there primarily to counter the, to, to continue to counter the Virginia. Virginia tried to draw the monitor into another action, but, but the Navy wouldn't, wouldn't engage because they didn't want to take any more chances. Um, and so they kind of just uh, had a standoff for most of the summer until, um, 
until the um, Union forces retook Norfolk and the, and the shipyard. When they did that, Virginia didn't have any place to go. Uh, she was too deep to get upriver to Richmond. And so the um, Confederates were forced to destroy her there um, in, in Hampton Roads, and they blew her up. Uh, the Monitor hung around uh, uh, for the rest of the year and then was ordered to go to go south to, to join a um, um, to, to, to join a, uh, some other uh, the other ironclads with an attack on on uh, on um, Charleston and she was being towed around uh, um, Cape Hatteras in a storm on December 31st and got hit by a bad storm and sunk there so so she was sunk off off Cape Hatteras. Of course, she was subsequently uh, recovered, or parts of her recovered, and she's now in the uh, the Monitor Center in Newport News, which is just a magnificent place. If you've ever had it, if you ever have a chance to go there, I highly recommend it. Hey, sir. Skip has a question. Uh, you know, certainly the the Virginia brought a lot of uh, fear. Uh, to the north, to the U.S., uh, D.C., et cetera, and some of the harbors up north. Is after the Hamptons Road battle, what were some of the highs and lows of the ironclads uh, for the rest of the war? Um, well, the uh, the Confederates built uh, a number of, of what they call casemate ironclads, like Virginia, and um, um, in, both on the East Coast and in New Orleans, they tried to build a couple. Up on the rivers, they tried to build a couple. None of them were ever really very successful. Um, as I said, the, the Union built a whole bunch of monitors, and they used them primarily in the blockade and, and uh, along the coast uh, to try to, to counter any of the Confederate ironclads. Um, and there were... Um, um, there were a couple of other um, actions between them, but uh, nothing quite as dramatic as the Bonner and the Virginia. And the um, the one major attack that they, they tried to use monitors to attack Charleston Harbor in 1863 and discovered that they didn't do well against fortifications. And a lot of them, a number of them were damaged and one sunk. So that wasn't terribly successful. Were they, uh, were they employed at the Battle of Mobile Bay in August of 64? Uh, uh, yes. Um, the uh, the um, Confederate um, ironclad, uh, the, the uh, CSS Tennessee was there. And then they had a couple uh, dual turret monitors there, um, along with... Um, uh, Farragut's uh, deep water, uh, big, uh, big uh, traditional steam vessels. And uh, they essentially surrounded the Confederate ironclad and just battered her into submission. Uh, she didn't have much of a chance just because she was overwhelmed by, uh, by all the vessels surrounding her. And so that was, that was the one other major engagement. Hey, sir, what happened? Uh, Beth had a question about what happened to the Minnesota. Well, they, re they finally refloated the Minnesota and got her back into action. And, and she, ser she served the rest of the war. Okay. So um, she, um, she, she recovered, was not, uh, not severely damaged. Okay. And uh, Skip has another question about the Galena, uh, which was uh, Grant's place of residence. Is there any connection there <coughs> with uh, why the name Galena? Was that... Um, I, I probably, I'm not really. That's a good question. I'm not sure, but they, but they tended to, to name um, um, uh, a lot of these vessels after cities, and particularly river cities. And so Galena was chosen for that particular vessel. Um, I don't know if it had anything to do with with Grant's hometown or not. Um, oddly enough, the Galena was not successful as an ironclad. Um, she and the monitor went went up the uh, um, uh, up the 
of the James to attack uh, 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 Fort um, uh, Dur Drury's Bluff. And, um, but the guns, the Confederate guns were so high on the bluffs that the plunging fire went through her thick deck armor. And uh, she was not successful as an ironclad. <clears throat> Eventually they removed most of her iron. Um, so she didn't do, she didn't do real well. The new iron sides was fairly successful as a seagoing ironclad. She spent most of her career on the blockade and, uh, and served on the blockade. Hey, sir, I have another question. Uh, you mentioned that, that um, the contractors were directed to uh, provide the government the monitor within 100 days. Um, the Virginia, I think, probably took much, much longer. And the question kind of pertains to the Tredegar Iron Works in Richmond. Uh, how impactful was that um, when it came to mo building ironclads for the Confederacy? Well, um, the Tredegar Ironworks was about the, on the only source of, of, of plate iron they had. And um, they, were, they were really delayed to, to try to roll and punch uh, the, the two-inch iron plates that they, that they needed for Virginia. And that did delay her quite a bit. If, uh, if, they, had, if they had gotten her built earlier before the monitor was ready, and that's one of the. That's another one of the what ifs, and she had gotten into uh, Hampton Roads, amongst those wooden warships before the Monitor got there. Uh, it would, might have been a different story, yeah. but uh, Tredegar always struggled to keep up with the demand for both the ironclads and all, also all the other guns and and railroad uh, uh, iron that they that they needed, um, and actually they. Um, if they had used less on the ironclads and more on the railroads, they might have been better off. But uh, that, that was a struggle for, for them all throughout the war. Yeah, I think, Dwight, if I recall in your book, uh, they actually tore up railroads to outfit the Virginia, right? Did I read that right? That, uh, yeah, that's right. They, they actually, um, uh, well, let's see, when Jackson took some of the railroads into Shenandoah, they they took the rails from that, and they, and they took rails from some of the secondary lines, and um, and in order to get get enough iron to to put together uh, for for the Virginia, yes sir, and that and that was a problem. Uh, Neil had a question about uh, uh, specific shortcomings of the Galena. I don't know if you can go into to detail on that or not. Uh, well, the Galena had had an odd kind of layered uh, clinker built um, um, uh, iron iron strips on her hull. It was it was a new process one they hadn't tried before, and her deck uh, had some armor plate, but I, I forget how thick it was, but it wasn't very thick at all. So uh, the plunging fire from um, uh, from Drury's Bluff pretty much. Uh, um, you know, destroyed a lot of her armor, and eventually they just decided that you know, she wasn't successful as an ironclad. So they removed most of her armor, and she she continued just as a gunboat. But, um, hey, sir, I have another question. Somebody, I guess, has also read your book. Uh, they met, they they quoted a um, a passage you had written in one of the starting chap beginning early chapters said. Uh, the monitor exemplified Yankee ingenuity and industrial prowess. The Virginia was the epitome of Confederate naval strategy and execution. Uh, just if you could expand on that a little bit. Yeah. Well, um, you, you have to give um, uh, Secretary of the Navy Mallory and um, the the officers that um, produced the the Virginia credit for for uh, innovation and, and hard work and doing, doing a lot with, with, with a little. And their, their design was, was simple but elegant. It's just an iron shed on top of an existing hull. And, and it served the purpose. Um, and, um, you know, what, what, what they accomplished with what they had was, well, was pretty impressive. But um, of course, it was it was not enough. 
Um, <clears throat> whereas the the monitor, of course, was just the um, um, an, a, an example of the burgeoning industry of the North, and um, the actually the whole business of contracting and subcontracting to civilian um, um, engineering um, plants to to build monitor and put put it put it together in pieces like they did what was uh, so, sort of the start of the whole business of of, of contracting uh, shipbuilding yeah to me that was one of the most fascinating parts of your book Dwight was you know how they built the monitor across you know different states and contractors like you said and you know civilian companies etc it was just it was a remarkable achievement in such a short mm -hmm. time frame mm -hmm. um any other questions, folks, ladies and gentlemen, for, for Dwight? Either in the uh, in the chat box or speak it out. Fine either way. We're all good. Okay. Hey, Dwight, on behalf of our uh, – I got to – hold on. On behalf of our Georgia Bulldog national champions, Alabama, <laughs> not Crimson Tide, Civil War Roundtable. <laughs> oh, so somebody's asking, was the Monitor of Virginia more influential in later, in, in later battleships? <clears throat> um, the, the, I, as I said, the only thing, the only real technical innovation that's important was the turret. And... Um, um, the, the monitor as a ship type was not uh, was not effective in the long run, um, and actually, even Ericsson's turret design was not the best. Uh, there was a British um, a British officer who um, had done a better job of designing a turret, which ended up to be kind of the basis for future turrets. Um, the big problem with the turret was weight. And the reason, one of the reasons Ericsson built it so low to the water was because uh, for stability and solving the stability problem with the heavy weight of the turret was a, was a, was a real problem. And they didn't really resolve that until later in the century. Uh, and actually that, uh, that British inventor built a ship with a couple of turrets on it build it higher on the, on the water, seagoing, ironclad with two turrets. And uh, as soon as they got it afloat, it turned turtle and went under and took him with it. So it was, it was, it was a problem. So um, I, there were other little inventions. I mean, the, the, the freshwater condenser and, and various other um, uh, a, um, auxiliary steam engines and and, and whatnot, gadgets, uh, you know, were uh, developed on into the, you know, later on, but the, the ships themselves were uh, not much more uh, influential than them. Okay, any other questions, folks? No. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Sorry, yeah. sorry for the rough voice. I hope everybody yeah. got it. Understand great, me. Great job, Dwight. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you very much. Thanks for great. your service, too. Hope you get to feeling better as well, also. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. It was very fascinating. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Another great presentation. Yeah. I learned a lot.